Chapter 5 Hannah walked home after her first day of school. It was only a few blocks, but it felt like miles, her feet heavy, her head heavier. She had done nothing but sit at a desk all day. But the effort of worrying, what Miss Walters thought of her, whether the other students could see her face despite the scoop on it, how she would ever amass enough courage to take it off, it had all been more exhausting than she could have imagined. Supper was ready when Papa came in from the building site. Hannah had made the batter for sourdough pancakes the evening before and left it to rest down cellar overnight. She fried slices of salt pork and cooked the cakes in the drippings and made brown sugar syrup as well. It was one of Papa's favorite meals. He might come up with a hundred reasons why he shouldn't go out to, she shouldn't go out to school, but his evening meal would not be one of them. Everything all right today, he asked as he forked up a bite from his second plate full of pancakes. He was hungry after a full day's work building the new shop. Hannah chose her words carefully. I might need to catch up a little in arithmetic, but I'm ahead in every other subject. Hmm, he said. He finished his food in silence. Then he looked at her closely. Any trouble? She shook her head, knowing that her anxiety and discomfort weren't the kind of trouble Papa meant. He was asking about trouble with the other students, the sort that came about because she wasn't white. If she were white, she wouldn't have to wear the bonnet. If she were white, she wouldn't have to ask about attending school. If she were white, Hannah could recall only one time in her life when she had wanted to be white. Back in Los Angeles, when she was around four years old, she'd seen an older girl whose blonde hair was all ringlets and curls. Hannah had taken a skein of yellow wool from Mama's knitting basket and played with it in front of the big mirror on the shop wall, draping the yarn over her head as she stared at her reflection. She'd been more interested in the curl than the color. She kept trying to twist and twirl the yarn into ringlets so different from her own straight tresses. Then Mama had seen what she was doing. Without a word, she took the wool away from Hannah. She brought out a hairbrush and a fine cord of red silk. After brushing Hannah's shoulder length hair, she plaited it carefully, weaving in the silk cord, then wrapping and tying it at the bottom of the braid. Standing behind Hannah at the mirror, Mama moved the braid to rest on Hannah's shoulder. Hannah saw the red silk cord against her black hair, both of them smooth and shining. From that moment on, Hannah never again wished for blonde curls. How she missed it, the feel of Mama's hands doing her hair. If she were white, she wouldn't be Mama's daughter. And she wouldn't have the same understanding of the precious knowledge that Mama had revealed to her a few weeks before she died. I'm half half too, just like you. Hannah didn't know a single person beside herself who was half Chinese and half white. Mama always said it made her special. When she was younger, some things about being half half did seem gratifying. Their dinner might be bread or potatoes or rice or noodles Chinese style. There were always two kinds of tea, green and black. Hannah could speak both Chinese and English. Papa knew some Chinese way more than most white people, but Mama's English had been better than his Chinese. So, as a family, they had always spoken English. When it was just Hannah and Mama on their own, they usually spoke Chinese. But Hannah had not spoken Chinese for more than a year now since leaving Salt Lake City, Chinatown. Sometimes she felt she could almost see her Chinese slipping away, the words flitting around the edges of her memory and then flying off one by one. Most of the time, being half Asian and half white was special in a hurtful way. White people, except for Miss Lorna and a few of her church friends, didn't like Hannah because she wasn't white. Chinese people accepted her but didn't like Papa because he was. Hannah's Chinese half was what Mama had given her. How could she ever wish that away? But why did her being half and half bother other people so much? Then she learned that Mama too was half and half. At the time, Mama's lungs were so bad that she was spending most of the day wrapped in the brown and red plaid shawl and huddled in the rocking chair. When she spoke, she had to strain for mouthfuls of air between words. Hannah recalled what Mama had said without those painful gaps. China is big, very big. Chinese people are all different. North, South, mountain people, river people, rice people, noodle people. 
Americans don't know this. They think all Chinese are the same. Mama told Hannah stories about China, about temples and palaces with roofs of gold, about rice that grew in water up to its knees, the greenest green you could ever imagine, about dragons and phoenixes, emperors and princesses, jade and pearls. Family stories too. Hannah learned about her grandmother, Mama's mother, who could embroider flowers and butterflies that you would swear were alive. And her grandfather, a merchant who traveled hundreds of miles every year to gather and sell a precious plant. Yansam, Mama said. She asked for paper and pencil, then wrote a Chinese word and showed it to Hannah. It looks like a man, head, arms, legs, grows like a potato. In the ground, Hannah asked, like a root? Root, yes, for medicine. Mama pulled the shawl more tightly around her. Listen, she said. I never told you this. My papa, he was not Chinese. He came to China from another place, a beautiful place, a secret place called Korea. Americans don't know that place. Hannah frowned, thinking hard. It's another country? Yes. So your mama was Chinese, but your papa? Yes, Korean. Mama smiled at her. I'm half, half too, just like you. Then she told Hannah some Korean stories about the rabbit who lived in the moon, the turtle in the Sea King's palace, how it was Koreans who had invented chopsticks and made the most beautiful pottery in the world. Mama didn't know very many Korean words. She'd spoken Chinese with her parents, but she was still proud of being half Korean. Your name is Hannah because of your grandmother, Mama said, your white grandmother. Hannah knew that. Papa's mother who lived in Tennessee, her name was Hannah. But for another reason too, in Korean, Hana means one. Mama held up her index finger. First daughter, best number one daughter. She wrote another Chinese character. Girl, like me, half half like me. This character means double happiness. That's you, you are my double happiness. That memory was an enormous comfort to Hannah, one that she would take with her to school the next day. When Hannah approached the schoolhouse in the morning, the oldest boys were playing catch in the yard while the younger pupils watched. The biggest girls were likely inside already. I am one of the big girls, so I ought to go in. Hannah's steps slowed. Such a struggle when something as simple as going into a building made her heart pound and her stomach twist but she forced herself to take another step and another and still another until at last she was over the threshold and in the lean-to, which served as an entry to the schoolroom. The lean-to had shelves and a double row of pegs along two of its walls with the coal bin in one corner, empty now except for a layer of coal dust. The schoolroom door was cracked open. Hannah heard voices on the other side. Think of any other reason? It's by far the simplest and the most logical. It just makes sense. The second voice was Dolly's. The first one, maybe Margaret's. I don't see the use of guessing. That was Bess. Oh, fiddle, Dolly again. It's her own fault for wearing it. She must have known it would make people wonder. And if it's not a horrible birthmark, it's probably some kind of nasty scar. Hannah went stone still. They were talking about her, wondering why she hadn't taken off her bonnet the day before. Her head down, she stared at the books in her arms. The hem of her sleeve was turned up a little, revealing the tiny lotus she had embroidered there. Not what I planned. I wanted to make at least one friend first. Rotten eggs, it'll be harder this way. But Mama would say, that doesn't give me an excuse not to try. She shifted the book so she could touch the stitches of the lotus on her sleeve and smooth the fabric into place. Inhaling sharply, she went back to the lean-to's threshold and kicked the door frame loud enough to be heard in the schoolroom. The talk stopped at once. Hannah set her books down on a shelf. She took off her bonnet and hung it on a peg. The space around her suddenly felt enormous, her face and head now exposed. She inhaled deeply and breathed out with a whoosh. Then she squared her shoulders and stepped into the schoolroom. 
Keeping her gaze straight ahead, she walked the few paces to her desk. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the reactions of the other girls. Margaret drew back a step. Edith stayed where she was. Bess turned toward Hannah, the smallest of movements, so subtle that Hannah thought she might have imagined it. And Dolly? Dolly's mouth and eyes were perfect circles of astonishment. Plainly, it hadn't even occurred to her to try to disguise her surprise. She might be more honest than the others, or not as well brought up. The air was so heavy with tension that when Miss Walters spoke, her voice seemed muffled. Good morning, Hannah, she said. I'm just going to ring the bell now. Good morning, Hannah replied. She was startled that her own voice sounded quite calm. Quickly, she slid into her seat and opened her reader. For the moment, it seemed that the girls were following Miss Walter's example, acting as if nothing was out of the ordinary. They made their way to their desks as the bell rang and the other students began entering. Hannah didn't dare steal a glance at Dolly's face. The younger pu pupils moved toward the front of the room. None of them took any notice of her. But as the older boys went to their places across the center aisle, Hannah heard whispering. She kept her eyes resolutely on her book, even as those whispers seemed to crawl down her spine. Quiet, please, Miss Walter said firmly. Fifth reader class, please choose a selection and use it for your grammar lesson. Parse a sentence of at least 10 words on your slates. Fourth reader class, rise and come forward. She's not asking the fifth reader class to come to the front, which spares me having to stand up there. Miss Walters did not look in Hannah's direction, but Hannah sensed the most fragile of ties between them. <laughs>